See every prayer here, Lord. Amen. Okay, so let's <laughs> So this is the fifth seminar series talk this semester uh, for the International and Comparative Law Center. And we're very happy to have Alina here today speaking on the author in copyright law. Uh, so take it away. Thank you, John. It's an honor to be here among such distinct colleagues and, and friends. And I thank John and the International and Comparative Law Center for organizing and hosting this talk. My talk, The Author in Copyright Law, explores various conceptions of the author throughout copyright history and the influences of these different conceptions on the production and distribution of literary works. It is interesting to note that despite authors being the primary beneficiary of contemporary copyright laws, the law has not defined who an author is. Aside from the limited references to the author as the first owner of copyright in Section 201A of the Copyright Act, and that the author or other person for whom a work for hire was prepared would be, uh, sorry, or that the employer or other person for whom a work was prepared would be considered the author of a work of the work in Section 201B. There is no other mention of the author in the statute, but because the author is the first proprietor of copyright or the first owner of copyright, there is a need to be clear about who an author is and how we, as users and other producers of creative works, should manage our relationship with this elusive figure. I call the author an elusive figure because the author has undergone several metamorphoses throughout copyright history. Copyright laws, as we know, began as a modest set of ordinances that enabled members of a book publishing guild in England called the Stationers' Company to publish books. Established by Royal Charter in 1557, the company acted as the official government censor and used the government's interest in press censorship to assert power over the book trade. The right that the Stationers' Company claimed for its members, comprising printers and publishers, was a perpetual right to profits from the publication without fear from the publication of books without fear of piracy. Authors were barred from membership of the company, although from time to time the company granted copyright to authors. Though it must be noted that this form of copyright was a mere right to print and make profits and did not convey ownership. In this period in history, before the evolution of the copyright market, which started developing in the late 17th century, ownership of expression was not an ordinary incidence of authorship. The act of creativity was considered a worthy pursuit that was rewarded by the state. However, it did not produce property rights. Once a manuscript was sold, it belonged to the purchaser in its entirety. As G. E. Bentley remarked, a play script after it left the playwright's hands was no more the author's property than the cloak that he might have sold to the actors at the time. In this period in history, when literary and artistic productions thrived under a patronage system, the author was a serviceman creating for his patron in what may be characterized as a gift exchange between writer and patron. The writer produced literary works, praising his patron in exchange for honorary recognition and monetary rewards. The text was a gift to a patron over which the author claimed no ownership or property rights. With the emergence of the copyright market, the conception of the author as a writer in the service of his patron changed. With the copyright market, authors had an alternative way of earning their livelihood by selling their writings to a new and rapidly expanding reading public. However, writers did not have any safeguards to ensure that they would receive money from the sale of their writings, as they had no real control over how their works are used once they are in the market. 
and the give exchange model of the patronage system would not work. There would be no guarantee of payment once a piece of literary work was given to the public. During the Renaissance, the author was considered a craftsman who used rhetorical and poetic rules and techniques to manipulate traditional materials and produce a desirable work. But where the work created is more of an is more of uh, is more elevated in status or is more majestic in some sense, for example, the Sistine Chapel, the creator is said to be a channel of external and sometimes divine inspiration. These conceptualizations of the author changed as the market emerged. The vision of author as a craftsman was discarded and the inspiration for creativity came to be internalized as a source emanating from within instead of outside of the author. This change in the conception of the author created the original genius, like what we know as the romantic author who became his distinct and unique, uh, who because of his distinct and unique personal experience, uh, expression that came to be embodied in the work, is to be the rightful owner of it. Right. So there was a there, at this point, property rights began to be claimed over creative works. In this sense, Edward Young, as an example, preached originality in place of craftsmanship, urging authors to, and I quote. Thyself so reverence as to prefer the native growth of their own mind to the riches import from abroad. Such borrowed riches make us poor. The man who thus reverence himself will soon find the world's reverence to follow his own. His works will stand distinguished. He is the sole property of them, which property alone can confer the noble title of an author that is, of one who thinks and composes, while other invaders of the press only read and write." Unquote. By urging authors to be original, Young would have been able to justify a writer's ownership of his work based on the notion of originality and elevate the author to the status of genius. With the conception of the author as genius, Authors could then claim property rights in their work as they entered the marketplace to sell their writings. These two contrasting images of the author, first as a craftsman and second as a creative genius in copyright history, have appeared in conventional miniatures that decorated manuscripts for centuries. <coughs> Woodcut blocks were made of this author portraits and the contrast between the gift exchange tradition of the patronage system and the commercial money-oriented qualities of the literary marketplace was obvious. These two images, which appeared in André de la Vigne's manuscript, show this contrast. The image on the left depicts the gift exchange between author and patron. With the author, here he is a poet. Um, kneeling down before his patron, King Charles VIII, to offer his book as a gift. The image on the right, over here, is a conventional image of the genius author, who alone in his study creates an entirely new and original work. And in this picture, the relationship between author and publisher was never depicted. The author was usually shown alone as the romantic genius. By the time the Statute of End was passed in 1710 as the first modern copyright law, authors were no longer considered mere craftsmen and were seen as being respectable professionals deserving of writing their work. Although I would know at this point that Lyman Ray Patterson, who writes a lot on copyright history, viewed the grant of copyrights to authors in the Statute of End as a convenient way of breaking up uh, printer and publisher monopolies in the book trade. But all in all, in this period, it was good for authors because the general public had already bought into the idea of the genius author deserving of ownership in the work. The passage of the Statute of the passage of the Statute of End, as Mark Gross pointed out, marked the divorce the divorce of copyright from censorship and the reestablishment of copyright under the rubric of property rather than regulation. 
The re-establishment of copyright under the rubric of property has significant legal and social consequences. The first, consequences of formalizing, the first consequence of formalizing copyright as a property right is the commodification of literary works, so that the work is no longer just a gift of expression or a product of intellectual and emotional exploration uh, to be communicated to, one re to one's readers. Instead, literature became a commodity that could be sold and transferred in a marketplace between author and reader. The reading public had replaced the patron as the author's primary source of economic support. And when German poet Johann Schiller broke away from the patronage of the Duke of Württemberg in 1781, he recasted himself as a professional writer and he said that the public is now everything to me. Something comes over me at the prospect of appealing to no other throne than the human spirit. He viewed the literary marketplace as a superior source of income. The commodification of literature assigned an economic value to works which before had no real economic value. And market values started to replace other social and communal values for creativity. Relationships that were formerly untainted by commerce changed into <coughs> commercial relationships. The second consequence of formalizing copyright as a proprietary right is the emergence as the author as a proprietor of, co of literary works. And the author's connection to the work as its creator forming the basis of proprietorship. As the author is the origin of the work, he is the rightful owner, entitled to first publish the work and make its first sale, if, if that's his choice. The Supreme Court acknowledged in Barrow Gills and Saroni that when a work embodies the intellectual conception of an author, it is original and thus entitled its author to its exclusive use of sale. The legal threshold for originality is low. All that is required is that the work was independently created by the author and not copied and that it possesses at least some minimal degree of creativity. Proprietorship of creative works by authors may be easily established by showing a very minimal level of creativity, or as the Supreme Court said in FICE publication and rural tele telephone services, some creative spark, no matter how crude, humble, or obvious it may be. As a proprietor, the author doesn't have to be a genius, he just needs to be creative, and as a proprietor, the author doesn't need to be human. He just needs to be legally capable of being a copyright owner. With public and legal acceptance of the notion of originality as the basis for exclusive rights, the concept of the author as proprietor became a very powerful metaphor to justify exclusive use of literary works. The argument for exclusive use is inherently utilitarian, in that exclusive rights and monopolies are tolerated for ultimately uh, the public welfare. Temporary costs from protecting an author's property rights are morally justified because of the results they produce, which is greater production of creative works that ultimately serves to benefit society and advance knowledge. And because the goal of copyright, uh, copyright, uh, the goal of the copyright system is to advance public welfare to the talents of authors, the notion of the, author, the the notion that the author would be the proprietor of his expression offers an attractive incentive for authors to harness and direct their talents towards creative activity. That in the eyes of the law, further public welfare. So throughout copyright history, as I as I played it out, we have three different conceptions of the author. First, as serviceman or a servant in service of the of paper as the romantic genius who should have property rights in, the, in, in their work and as the modern day proprietor. But if we were to ask any copyright scholar who an author is, I doubt we would get any satisfactory answer and know for certain who really is an, answer, uh, an author. Literary critics, particularly Michael Foucault and Roland Barthes, have argued that the conception of the author is socially contingent on the commodification of literature. Both have, in fact, gone as far as to say that the author and his relationship with his expression is non-existent. 
the author in whose physiology is dead is but to say, in that text stand alone and should be studied independently of its author's identity and personal attributes. Paul Griffith, uh, who is also uh, who writes on, on um, intellectual creativity, uh, but but writes it from a theological uh, viewpoint, um, argued that creativity, the basis for which proprietorship is awarded in copyright, is actually a divine attribute that human act human beings are incapable of. To Griffiths, only God creates. Humans collaborate with their divine creativity, which, as Griffiths say in his book Intellectual Appetite, cannot effectively be sequestered and as a result cannot be owned. Another way of saying this is that no one is entirely original in their expression, that the very act of authorship in any medium is, as Jessica Littman says in her article, the public domain. I quote, more akin to translation and recombination than it is to creating Aphrodite from the form of the sea. The courts have also made it more difficult to conceptualize who an author is. In 56 folk road music and UMG recordings, the court held that a recording company was the author of Bob Marley's sound recording, despite mm -hmm. the fact that Marley was the actual human creator. Because in the eyes of the law, a hiring party is considered the author of works made for hire, not the human producer of the work. And so, because the supposed beneficiary of copyright law exists on such nebulous grounds, the rights authors should have and how these rights affect communities and societies with increasing humanistic interests and goals for education, development and expression. It should be clear, should be made clear. The nature of right and creative works is a perennial one, and to a large degree, this will depend on how we conceptualize the author figure. Lyman Ray Patterson had said in his book, Copyright and Historical Perspective, that copyright law is difficult, complex, and as a whole, unsatisfactory because of the absence of fundamental principles that would unify the concept of copyright. Here I offer a plausible conceptualization of the author, which hopefully may produce greater clarity and certainty in copyright law. The author I propose would be an individual who finds human dignity through authentic exp expressions, and who creates for the sake of creativity because creativity in itself is a desirable human activity. The author as a human person expressing himself for the sake of expression differs from the serviceman, the genius, and the proprietor in several ways. First, the author is different from the serviceman because he writes for the sake of expression or communication and not for a patron. The product of the human author is his expression alone, where expression supports and upholds his individual dignity. <coughs> Second, the author differs from the genius in, it, in that he doesn't have to be completely original and produce works that has not been conceived of before. The best works in literary history are derivative of other works to a large extent. And third, the, author, the human author differs from the proprietor of copyright in that he is a human being, or as Robert George puts it, a being with a human nature, who possesses as a matter of natural law and natural rights an inherent value and dignity. He is not a legal author, as copyright, has, copyright law has deemed non-human entities, but a natural author, as commonly understood. Conceptualizing the author this way has tremendous implications for copyright law. The author, as a human person, changes the focus of copyright law from a law that focuses on public welfare and the market, uh, public welfare by incentivizing authors with market rewards to a law that focuses on the common good of society by encouraging authors to be dignified human beings to create for the sake of creativity and expression. By shifting its focus to the common good, copyright law would protect human flourishing instead of public welfare, identify with the notion of authentic authorship instead of romantic authorship, and would impose moral duties of stewardship as legal rights are granted to allow for some market rewards. While one would not advocate that authors give away expressions to society freely, 
without an expectation of recognition or remuneration, one could conceivably advocate that authorship being a social activity would require authors to be responsible <coughs> stewards of the knowledge they produce for their communities and societies. When this happened, the call for copyright laws to be fairer and more just can be based on a singular conception of the author as the human producer of a work that is more consistent with how we, as human beings, taking into account our basic human need for expression and understanding and communication, would naturally conceptualize the author. The call for fairer and more just copyright laws cannot occur without a clear conception of the author as a human being worthy of dignity being at the center of copyright laws. Copyright laws as we know it is inherently utilitarian and support for or critique for the copyright system have been primarily on grounds of utility. When social benefits from increased production of creative works outweigh harms caused by monopolies, copyright rules are considered good law. And when they don't, copyright laws are considered bad law and rejected. But depending on cost-benefit analysis, to find moral justification, justification for copyright laws will not yield satisfactory answers that would allow the actual content of legal rules to be evaluated. Inherently immoral, inherently immoral laws have at times produced desirable social consequences. To the extent that such desirable social consequences can be measured against undesirable ones on a commensurable scale. Because practical possibilities and the social outcome they produce are often incommensurable, which means that they cannot be weighed and measured on an objective standard of comparison, a cost-benefit or utilitarian analysis of the copyright system will not help us identify fundamental principles for copyright that will ensure that the laws themselves are clear, fair, and as a whole satisfactory. Without a commensurable skill to help us conclude that protecting expression is socially more beneficial than granting free access, access to expression or vice versa, we will not be able to determine the proper content of copyright laws and decide against an objective moral benchmark if they are just. Any rule that as a general theme maximizes public welfare will be considered socially, morally sound and acceptable by utilitarian calculuses. However, with a clear conception of the author as a human person deserving of protection um, of his human dignity um, uh, as the, in the, uh, being the cornerstone of copyright jurisprudence, we can expect a moral benchmark to be set against which one would be able to assess the fairness and morality of copyright principles. A clear conception of the human author would introduce moral reason into the copyright system as a basic good for creativity and the development of knowledge is chosen over instrumental goods such as the values of incentivizing creative production or increasing access to creative works. Use of, the, use of other works in the process of creating another piece of work will be considered ex ante fair use, as long as the use is within reasonable constraints that respect the dignity of past human creators. And corporations and other non-human organizations would not be able to claim themselves as authors entitled to control users of their works in the absence of a recognizable right that stems from possessing human dignity. Authorship as an essentially human activity is based on communal and social cooperation and conjures up moral duties and legal rights among those participating in the process. In conclusion, I just want to talk, uh, highlight this book, Morals by Agreement by David Goldfield, in which he argues that morality would work as the necessary constraint on the interaction of rational processes uh, and facilitate cooperative behavior when it is necessary and possible for the common good of society. To build an ecology where human dignity is upheld and society thrives and flourishes through the use and production of creative works, Individuals and communities must commit and cooperate to protect the human good. And I would say in, in conclusion that this can only be done when the protection of the common good of society is seen as inextricably tied in to the protection of the human author and human dignity.
so the protection is part of the common good then? Yes, protection is part of the common good, but it's the protection not of market incentives, right. but human dignity. So I have a question. Um, I'm thinking about like um, if you go to former colonized countries, one of the issues that has come up, like you'll have a tribe in South America or something, and you have someone like Hernando de Soto uh, speaking, and, and he'll go out there and say, look, they have these practices or this uh, commodity they've created, this herb or this medical practice or a type of way of cutting down timber or whatever, and this should be patented. And if we turn this into a commodity and give ownership rights, we'll uh, create, uh, you know, like this, th this is how we get money going and generate income, and this is why they get left behind is because they don't have this sort of, like, right. ability, right? So let's commodify these things, right? And we can't commodify it as a collective, like they're saying. So they're saying, look, it's not something we own. Mm -hmm. It's something that's uh, shared or a practice. So you say, no, no, no. We're going to come on fire. And then, uh, in addition to that, when they say, okay, well, we'll do it collectively, you go, no, 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 no. Uh, you can't incorporate a community. What you can, and, and we don't want state ownership, my God. Uh, instead, what we want is an individual to control, or a group of shareholders to get together and incorporate, or, and, or one person. Okay, so dignity of the individual, individual ownership, authorship, you know, someone looks at what's going on and takes the pieces and says, okay, I got it, the pastiche. In that sense, the argument for the human being, dignity, individual author, ownership of commodity could easily be uh, sort of like captured very easily on the international level, right? How would you, how would you think this really interesting study or the way you're looking at it in terms of the author in a Western context, how would you, how would you know, do a comparative like that? Yeah, I, I would argue that, that dignity would be inherently inalienable, yeah. and therefore you would not alienate, alienate that dignity to a corporation. So a corporation would never be able to claim authorship status, but I would, I would think but, that... But, the, but that would mean I can't assign it, I can't sell it. No. Right. You cannot sell dignity, but right, you can right. sell the, the work. And so I, I think I think really maybe the, the, the real the real issue is whether the commodification of the work uh, affects human dignity. Because right now the commodification of creative works have always been um, analyzed from a market perspective, right? The, old, the only reason and, and John rightly pointed out the only reason why we want to commodify all this knowledge is because it brings us the, the rewards that, we would, that we're going to use to build up this community. But if the commodification in itself goes against human dignity, in that commodification denies all these people what they're rightfully entitled to, then the commodification should not be allowed. Right? The, the, the incident that I'm thinking about is, you all may know Henrietta Lex, and you all might, might know this case where um, Henrietta Lex, they found, uh, she was being treated at John Hopkins for cervical cancer, and they found a, a cell, mm. and they, they harvested it, and they sold it, right. and they made millions, and her family died, and she died in poverty, and her family is still in poverty, and they never knew the millions that were made from the commodification of the cell. I mean, that's a separate issue completely, it's not created both, but it's, it's analogous, in that, in that the family only knew about the millions that were made from the cell line when people who bought her cell line started calling the family for information about, you know, genetics and, back, you know, medical background and all that. That's one incident where the common commodification, I think, offends human dignity. The second incident I, I, I would refer you to is, um, it's, uh, I, I, uh, Solomon, I think his last name is Solomon, I'm forgetting his first name, but he wrote the song that became Disney's um, The Lion Sleeps Tonight. And Disney made millions from, from, I mean he wrote the song, it came up um, in the African top 
top charts, the top billboard. Because they own it, right? Right, and then Disney took it. Disney made millions from uh, musicals, the, 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 the cartoon, and he never received anything. And that again is an affront. He, he eventually died of a treatable disease. If he had a, a treatable, yeah, a treatable disease, if he had the money, he would have been, he would have been able to. And he died really young, like uh, 53, I believe. But all this only works really if you um, widen or open up the definition of what human dignity inherits, or, or yes. as part of human dignity. Yes. So, so I mean, in essence, I'm, you, you kind of defined it negatively, but um, what you're really saying not only um, is authorship or co the copyright uh, rooted in dignity, you also say the fact that it can be commoditized or, or can be sold commercialized. Um, is also part of the thing. Yeah, I don't think I don't think commodification in itself, or or selling the work in itself, is an affront to human dignity. But I also think that commodification can be an affront to human dignity. Right, but for copyright, they are together. They they are tied together. Right now, yes. Because I have to, or pro any property right, because I have to have the right to alienate it. Yes. And, uh, and so in that sense, I can't separate, in, in terms of the way you want to do it, I can't really separate that. Right, and I, I think, and I think it's, pro it's, it's an idea that I probably need to work more with, and I think that human dignity should not be set. Human dignity cannot be eliminated, but the expression can. Right, that makes sense. But would, Which, the, I mean, would there be alien... Er in, in the Henrietta Lacks case, right, I mean, there's obviously a big issue of she doesn't do anything, right? It's sort of like a windfall, but it just so happens mm -hmm. that right. she's got this unique, but she doesn't do anything. It takes all that manipulation by the scientist to find any value. So right. there's a real question of whether she would just get a windfall. But, it, right. I mean, but with the argument with Henrietta Lacks or with the, the Lion Sleep Snake Guy, which was in Eddie Murphy's Come to America, by the way, too. Was, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I mean, would you still consider there to be an affront to human dignity if they had been paid? So if Henrietta Lacks gets a million dollars, or if the guy in Africa gets a million dollars, is there still an affront to human dignity? And if not, doesn't the existing framework work? It sounds like, had they copyrighted, right, or patented or gotten some protection, then there would have been the money there, and then, or are you saying that money notwithstanding, there's an affront to human dignity in those two situations? So even if Henry Lacks got money, there would still be an affront to her yeah. dignity. Or this guy in Africa who wrote The Line Sleeps Tonight. Even if he got paid and they weren't exploiting him or exploiting Henry Lacks. That's what I'm trying to understand. Yeah, and I, I don't think I'm, I'm, nece I'm necessarily saying that the commodification in itself is an affront to human dignity. And therefore, if, if Henry Lacks or, or, or Solomon gets paid, it, it, would, it, it would it would not affront human dignity, but but. but the question really is then what, what Jonas says: Where does it start? Where does it end? What what satisfies the requirement of dignity? The windfall, the million dollars, or the two million dollars? What is it? Does she have to write off on yeah. it? <coughs> and I think the difficult the the reason why there is difficulty in conceptual conceptualizing human human dignity is because we we've tied in the the notion of creative works to the ability to commercialize. And therefore, and, and therefore... Uh, You're trying to deconstruct that, I assume. Yeah. You're trying to separate... Yeah, that, 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 that we've gone too far into thinking that creative works are commodifiable, that we've lost sight no. of the, the, the dignity in expression. That it's only valuable because of the monetary nature, right? Right. It's valuable independently of its monetary aspects. Exactly. Right. right. But but right right now we've forgot we forgotten about the other part, and then the only important thing is that we are able to com to commodify. But, but are you saying it only has value because of, uh, of the uh, of commerce or not? No, human dignity has inherent value. Right. So so in, in context of those. Uh, all the definitions as a service component, it's, 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 
it has value too mm -hmm. to the to the community. Yes. Right. Yes. Now, I mean, my my perspective on on human dignity is that that commerce commerce is really part of dignity. So I actually, in a, in a sense, come a little bit from the other direction at this. I say, in order to define what human digni dignity to, is today, I have to say, participating in commerce in the market, that has to be part of yeah. dignity. And if I do that, then I can tie mm -hmm. the copyright to that. Right, right. But what you do is you, 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 you set the dignity as a, whether it's a God-given right, mm -hmm. a natural right, you set this and then you yes. tie uh, the copyright and the right to commercialize it to right. that. Now, and, and I think that's such an interesting, interesting point that you raise, and and it's interesting because the the value that copyright represents, that means the ability to commercialize and all that, is really not a basic value, right? It's something uh, that that we that is instrumental towards a goal to make money, to encourage creativity, and all that. And the way the copyright system has justified the commodification is, well, if we, if we grant property rights that will allow those works to be sold, then it will bring all this money and they will create some more for public wealth. But that idea is, is completely, it's, it's, a, it's a second level need than basic human dignity and creativity. The reason why we create is because we want to create because of our human nature. So, I, I have a question for you. Wonder if, so here's, here's what I was thinking. If you take Foucault, Foucault says the search for an origin is, is an empty quest, yeah. right? In the Nietzsche piece, right? Genealogy of history. And a way of thinking, like, and you have an origin, human dignity, right? There's something that's a baseline. So I just, I wonder if instead of making a polemic for human dignity, if what, how would it look differently if you thought about how if you thought of human dignity as a as as something that is rhetorical and functions in different ways across time differently, and looking at the stakes of adopting different arguments and not others. So it would look something like this. So on the one hand, you know, you you have an idea that creativity is internal and individual, but you could look at institutional economists like Babelin who say, no, creativity and the drive to produce is structured and manufactured, right? right? So it's, it's hard to square those. Right. Or you could say, um, the, our ideas of human dignity were built out of the development of capital, where the idea of the individual author came, right? But, but if it came out of that, how do we claim it was before? That's a typical... So I, and it comes with a lot of secondary apparatuses. So when we say, let's have the individual own, we have to have copyright law, we need to bring experts down, we need lots of secondary property rights. And right. So we're implementing a whole political regime that may or may not give dignity, right? So if you go to the South American people in Peru, they're not really happy with getting the dignity of individual ownership. They want a different one. Yeah, they, right? They're, so my only... the. Um, so my question, I guess what I would be really interested in, because I love this, it's amazing, but what I'd be really interested in is instead of like making an argument for human dignity where we know it's going to constantly fight a rear guard effort, it's so easy to do the cynicism, mm -hmm. I wonder what would happen if we identified every single way that human dignity and commodification operate against each other yeah. and start mapping it out. How would you okay. do that? Yeah, it, it's it's a it's a uh, I I think it's it's also that you can say well there's all these different conceptions right mm. but when when we when we when we start with that premise then we say well if that's the case then let's make choices among different values depending on where we are mm. and we never really have a concrete framework for the copyright system copyright system the copyright system becomes whatever you want it to be in your in your, in your individual context, yeah. context. And, and that's the problem uh, as, as I would argue with a lot of laws that laws are inherent that laws have been treated as being instrumental towards policy goals towards precisely because
because we, we bought into this idea that, oh, there is no one definition of human dignity, or there's no one definition of the person. But if we, if we change that thinking and say, well, there's actually one view of who a, 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 a human person is, then there really isn't that much right. maneuvering. But, but, and so I actually think that Alina's approach has a benefit over yours because the, 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 the nice thing about human dignity as a term is I can't actually define it. Right. It's the same thing like with the rule of law. It's, right, the same thing, right, exactly. Yeah. You, you know that we need the rule of law. Right. We don't really know, we know it looks kind of like, like this, right? right? Laws have to be certain, you know, and all that. But it doesn't change wherever you go, you know, everyone has an idea of what the rule of law is. So I think that's interesting. The idea that uh, the promise of law is its formal emptiness, its universality in that it provides a framework by which politics will take place and sets... But don't don't it, define it negative, emptiness, just say... Well, it inherently allows God, everyone to participate. Right. So, we, because we can't limit human rights to one person, right. I'm human, you're right. human, everyone, part, it's a universal democratic ideal, right. even, and we become, as a political sensibility, attuned to difference, attuned to exclusion and stuff. I wonder to what degree, though, in that argument, you know, like uh, Victor Hugo's thing, everyone has the right to sleep under a bridge, or between equal rights, force right. decides. Right. So the idea is pas So I would just pose an anti Pascalian wager, right? Pascal said, look, believe, because if you don't believe, like, as long as you believe, even if it's not true, you make it, right? You're fine. But what Pascal doesn't take into account is the lost opportunity cost of believing versus doing something else. So, what are the possible lost opportunity costs of not believing and acting on not belief in this life? It's, right? Like, that's not there. So I wonder if, if I pose that at human dignity, and I'm not making an argument, I'm just thinking. If I said back, well, when we adopt the idea of human dignity, even if it's a, a broad thing, there's still lots of exclusions in the human dignity, liberal democratic model, right? And it seems very particular to a certain period of time, right? Uh, so I just wonder what are the what would be possibly the lost opportunity costs when we adopt that model rather than trying to do something totally different? But, but, but before you add, if you say lost opportunity costs, you already fix it. What do you mean? You, you, the the, the definition of Dignity now, you, you try to nail it down, and so, so it's no longer floating, it's no longer flexible. Mm. And how do you define, where do you start with what the transaction costs are? Right, I see what you're saying. So what I mean by that is, dignity, when you invoke dignity in a, a legal setting, or in a political setting, it's become a rhetorical tool that's highly routinized and predictable, and there's institutional apparatuses ready to deal with it in any given situation. So Palestine asserts human right. dignity, we kind of know where to go. And what that does is it shuts the door for a lot of political movements or expressions that would seek to escape their situation or do something radically different. It'd be seen as too out there, disrupting the dignity of someone else. Right. So if you, so I just wonder about if dignity is not a thing that exists somewhere in the ether or inside our core soul, but rather a way we describe how we do governance and how we understand meaning and how we organize people according to certain institutionalized practices and traditions of talking politics. I wonder to what degree that would shift the fo and I don't know if it would. I'm not arguing against you. I wonder to what degree it would shift the focus. Then human, human dignity loses the value for which it stands for, mm -hmm. which is a basic good. So you've made you've made human dignity a value that you would balance against other values such as free speech and all that. And these values are non-commensurable. You, you cannot possibly measure on an objective scale. That's exactly right. And here's my argument to that. Right? My argument to this is I've said this for for many years now. Is that that 
you're just, in essence, really replacing the term natural law with human dignity. So human dignity is becoming the natural law of today. I because I don't want to put a value on, on that, I, I, I can't really do that. And the same is with, with, with regard to dignity, uh, because um, whatever uh, John is trying to do, he's trying to fight over it, put a value on it, and try to own, he's trying to own human dignity, and exactly what you said, to take the universality away from it. So you can't touch it, really. Yeah, and it has to be flexible. Yeah, because it's a basic, it's a basic value that you have right. to choose if it's in is it more a concept maybe than a value? Basic concept rather than a value? Yeah. I'm taking your value. Yeah. So I think here yeah. we get into yeah. trouble. If we say it's a concept, a formal idea, a deal, we get around the idea of it being uh, tra transcendental, right? Yeah. But we get into yeah. the pr we still get into the problem of being coming like a, a Kantian categorical imperative. He's coming, right? he's coming our way now. So if you say it's a categorical imperative, right. thou shall not pass, right. and, you say, and you say, look, I'm going to hold this out as something that's untouchable. Yeah, and, and I don't think human dignity as a conceptual concept, as I think about it, would be deontological. In the, mm. it's, it's, a, it's an imperative. Right? It's, it's more like a virtue. Right. It's a... Yeah. But virtue, if we think about the definition of virtue, virtue was always how to respond to a real set of situations that one is confronted with. Right. And the real set of situations that we are confronted with is the, the mark. And wouldn't that mean that our idea of how we understand this word or thing yes. is very situational? But, that, but that's, what, that's, the, that's an old definition. You have to define it based on the con context, based on uh, the cultural mm. uh, the country imperative of the time. And it stands beyond the cultural imperative. Yeah, so if I, I can, went, but yeah. I can only do this uh, if you do what Alina says. Yeah. If I leave the concept or the value uh, as a basic uh, transcendental uniform, yeah. universal, not uniform, yeah. universal. Um, among, around which political decisions, right. discussions function, as opposed to. I wonder if we didn't focus on the word dignity, but we focused on the word human, right? So the idea of the human... No, you want to get... I'm not going to let you get... The, <laughs> the same game, because the idea of dignity is rooted in the, this idea that there's a person, and these people, across time, place, culture, have certain fundamental ways that they... rights or acts that they believe, or something like that. And that idea of the individual... But is it's exactly. But it's a patent human. Say what? It's a patent. Authorship is human, but what about a patent? Well, the very. I think like going beyond saying that you and I are. Patent a, on an a, iPhone. Look, not in, on the, a in the order of things, right? By Foucault, yes. he starts it off by saying, "I was reading Borges, and in Borges, I started laughing, and that was the version of my book because I read about in China in the 13th century or something." There was uh, 26, uh, they classified everything in humanity, everything in the world, according to 26 classifications. And it was very strange classifications. This is a very Bart point, right? You don't talk about tall cats, you talk about fat cats. Well, why don't we associate tall with cat, usually, right? And he said, I looked at the classifications and they were completely arbitrary, but right? What you're not so, doing, you're doing algebra, that's algebra. No, so the point being, when they look at beyond saying maybe we're the same species, and in some cultures you wouldn't think that across time, uh, you know, like how they looked at us, I don't think we can go much further than saying we're part of the same species with certain organism-type functions. The moment we read in personality, hum ideas of humanity or something, we start looking very historically contextualized. Right, so an understanding of someone 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago would probably have been so radically different we couldn't even speak to each other in many situations. Yeah, but I, I, don't, think, I don't think human dig dignity is historically contingent or socially contingent. Right. I think human dignity, like if, if 
you look at, regardless of, of time frame, if you look at, at an activity that is an affront to human dignity, the mm. immediate response is, well, that's the trauma, regardless of time. You know, the, the, in, the, the inquisition, I mean, you would say, well, that is wrong, it's an affront, it is an affront to human dignity, even if within the context. I mean, for me, the biggest challenge is in this term, dignity is, for, for me, dignity is a uh, definition from, from the bottom up, meaning it requires the bare minimum, right? And the, the, question is, the, the question is what the bare minimum is. How can I define that bare minimum? And so, so I think I, I, I don't necessarily want to define it, but what the understanding of bare minimum is, is different in the United States than it is in, in Africa in some countries. So I think that's the big dif that's the big difference, and so this is where I, I'm not sure how this would work. So, uh, you know, in a sense, it's a luxury for us to, to go and try to define uh, um, protection of uh, copyright in the way we th think, uh, and in a sense, it's a luxury when compared to to the person in Africa who wants to write the song and sell it. Oh, they have a school. Ah, uh, their friends. Okay, all right, we can talk. Okay. Talk it. Yeah. Oh, that's sorry.